purpose. Okay, we're, we're not live on the Facebook yet. Okay. Are we good to go, Doug? Yes, okay. we are. And we're live on Facebook? I'm double checking, but yes, it says okay. yes. Excellent, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, sorry for, we had a couple of technical difficulties. Um, we're gonna go ahead and click into the housekeeping uh, slide number, if you will. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go over a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. And just so you all know, this session is being recorded um, and a recording of this will be shared on our website. Uh, this session is also being streamed Facebook Live. For those watching on Facebook, we'll try to keep track of any questions that are coming in um, or any comments um, and apologies if we miss anything. Uh, all attendees are on mute, no worries, and your videos are not on display, so no worries there. Uh, please submit your questions through the Q&A function below. Uh, we will save the questions throughout the teaching series, and we will uh, follow up um, and have our panelists answer those um, and then share that um, with our audiences. Uh, you may register for the upcoming teachings at Bitly Native Perspectives Uranium. And um, if you have registered for this session, then you are automatically registered for the next uh, four sessions. So uh, I am going to go ahead and introduce uh, myself and my colleagues this evening before we get started. Uh, I am uh, Talia Boyd. I was born and raised on the Navajo Nation. I'm a mother and a community organizer. I have spent years on um, grassroots organizing in rural and indigenous communities, um, specifically on environmental and social justice issues, um, including working closely with um, communities to address uranium legacy issues, to protect sacred landscapes, indigenous voting rights, and community radio. I am currently the Cultural Landscapes Program Manager for the Grand Canyon Trust. <clears throat> Next, I would like to introduce my colleague, Amber Ramado. She, is, she was raised in Wyoming, stunning red desert on a small off-grid ranch. Amber spent the year after her undergraduate studies in environment and natural resources, doing part-time conservation work and exploring the West. A, a 2011 raft trip down the 277 miles of the Colorado River inside the Grand Canyon was all it took for her to fall in love with Northern Arizona. She completed a master's at Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, where she studied groundwater policies and their inadequacies in the face of rampant energy development. That's also where she met her husband, Evan, and discovered an addiction to trail running. Before coming to the trust, she spent nearly four years in Lander, Wyoming, where she worked with folks from a wide array of backgrounds on energy related air and water quality issues for the Wyoming Outdoor Council. Oh, there are 14 people joined. Oh, okay, thank you, Doug. Uh, next, I would like to introduce my colleague, Megan Kelly. Megan was raised on the Eastern shore of Maryland, growing upside growing up beside the beautiful and imperial Chesapeake Bay. She became aware of the imbalance between humans and nature at a young age after learning her undergraduate degree at uh, St. Mary's College of Maryland. 
uh, Megan worked in environmental consulting and traveled wherever she could. Megan's first trip to Patagonia inspired her to pursue an MBA in a global social and sustainable enterprise at Colorado State University, where she studied ways to, that business can be used to address major global challenges. During her time in Colorado, Megan fell in love with the Colorado Plateau and made trips there as often as possible. Megan is excited to be so close to and working to protect her favorite places in the country. Thank you, ladies, for joining me this evening. Um, and I wanna go ahead and pass the mic to Megan. And just to give us a quick rundown, um, Megan is gonna go first and then Amber and, and then myself. And we're um, covering uh, the work that we've been doing within the Grand Canyon Trust within our energy program and also within our cultural landscapes program. And we're really introducing uh, the next four teach-ins of our native experts and panelists. So without further ado, I'd like to pass the mic to Megan. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Talia and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Um, so just before we get started, a little bit of background. Uh, the Grand Canyon Trust is a regional nonprofit conservation organization. Uh, we're headquartered in Flagstaff, Arizona with satellite offices all across the Colorado Plateau. Um, our mission is to safeguard the wonders of the Grand Canyon and the Colorado Plateau while supporting the rights of its native peoples. For those of you unfamiliar with the Colorado Plateau, it spans much of what you might know as the Southwest, including the four corners where Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah meet. It broadly stretches north to south from the Uinta Mountains in Utah to the Mogollon Rim in Northern Arizona, and west to east from the Great Basin in Utah to the Western slope of the Rocky Mountains in Colorado in, in Northwestern New Mexico. Next slide, please. So this is just an outline of what we'll be talking with you about today. So first, I'm going to give you kind of a uranium 101. We'll briefly define the nuclear fuel cycle, and then we'll get into what uranium is, what it's used for, where it comes from, and how it's mined. And then Amber is going to discuss the impacts of uranium mining on the environment and human health, particularly in Native communities. And then Talia will lead you through a discussion focused on uranium milling and some of the issues uh, surrounding the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle. Next slide, please. So today's conversation is going to take us part of the way through the nuclear fuel cycle. Um, the nuclear fuel cycle consists of front end steps that prepare uranium for use in nuclear reactors and a back end which consists of steps to manage, prepare, and dispose of used but still highly radioactive nuclear fuel. The front end of the nuclear fuel cycle is represented on this graphic by the blue boxes. And briefly, it looks like this. So, um, first, there's the exploration phase where uranium miners search for uranium deposits to mine from the Earth's crust. And then once those deposits are found, the actual mining begins and uranium ore is extracted from the Earth using one of several methods that I'll, I'll get into a little bit later. And then once extracted from the Earth, your, the uranium goes to a mill to be separated from the ore itself and turned into a concentrated uranium oxide powder called yellow cake. After that is the conversion process where the yellow cake is converted into a gas called uranium hexafluoride. And then that gas undergoes an enrichment process so that it can be used in a nuclear reactor. And then this enriched gas is then sealed into canisters where it cools and solidifies before it's transported to a nuclear fuel reactor assembly plant. And there, the now solid substance goes through fuel fabrication where it's converted into nuclear fuel. And to do this, it's heated into a gaseous form once again, and then it's chemically processed to form a powder. And that powder is then compressed into pellets that are sealed into these long metal tubes to form uh, nuclear fuel rods to be used in nuclear reactors. The back, <clears throat> excuse me, the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle, which you can see in the yellow, uh, begins after the fuel is used in the reactor. Um, so since the fuel rods are still radioactive after being used, the rods are stored underwater for several years, after which they can be moved to dry storage at the power plant. And then after dry storage, they have to go to a permanent underground repository, which is one of the most problematic and challenging aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle. And Talia is going to touch on that later. Next slide, please. So what is uranium? Uranium is a naturally radioactive element that's found all over the world. It's very common in the Earth's crust, and it's mostly used as fuel to create nuclear energy and also for weapons and nuclear warfare. And while it's common in trace amounts, it's less commonly found in high enough concentrations that uranium miners want to extract it. 
So miners are looking for uranium ore deposits that deposits that can contain economically recoverable concentrations of uranium. So meaning the concentration of uranium found in the ore is high enough that it's economically feasible to warrant extraction and processing. And just as a reminder, a reminder um, uranium ore simply refers to the unprocessed rock containing uranium before the uranium is extracted from it, which you can actually see in the upper left photo here. Um, so the higher the grade of ore, the more uranium is present in proportion to everything else. And so, like I said, miners are looking for uranium deposits and they want these deposits to be high grade. Some of the highest grade uranium deposits in the world are found in Canada and Australia, where ore can contain upwards of 20% uranium oxide. And while the grade of ore in the United States does not come close to this quality, unfortunately, some of the richest known deposits of uranium ore that are found here are found in the Grand Canyon region. And these deposits um, contain less than 1% uranium oxide. But no matter where the uranium industry operates, they've left a path of in injustice in indigenous communities. At the moment, uranium mining in the Grand Canyon region is not economically viable. So that means that the amount of work required to extract the uranium ore from the earth and process it into the final end use product would cost more than the uranium is currently worth. Next slide, please. So like I said, uranium is common in the earth's crust, but it's not as common in high enough concentrations to warrant mining. On the Colorado Plateau, uranium deposits are found near the Grand Canyon in vertical formations called breccia pipes, which you can see in the graphic to the left. A breccia pipe is usually, a like, is usually thousands of feet deep and about 300 feet in diameter. And the beginning of breccia pipe formation starts in the red wall limestone, which is the green band at the bottom of the graphic. And so what happened to form this breccia pipe was underground caves formed in the limestone as the rock reacted with um, carbon dioxide laden water and dissolved. And then over time, those caves in the red wall limestone collapsed in on themselves, which, tr which triggered the collapse of the rock layers above them as well. And then from these pieces of collapsed rock, breccia was formed, which is rock composed of fragments of other smaller rocks and minerals. And because of the prevalence of trace amounts of uranium in soil, trace amounts similarly occur naturally in groundwater. So the key to uranium dissolving in groundwater is the presence of oxygen. When oxygen is present, uranium is very likely to dissolve and flow with any water it comes into contact with. And when ox oxygen levels are low or absent, uranium, might, uranium and other minerals come out of solution and water won't be able to carry them away. So over time, mineralized groundwater flowed through the breccia pipe and where oxygen became scarce, uranium and other minerals deposited in that location. And then over more time, trace amounts of minerals built up into concentrated amounts forming uranium deposits um, like this here that miners are looking for. And it's for this reason that we say uranium deposits are safer where they are. And it's only when we dig them up and reintroduce oxygen to the equation that the uranium becomes a significant and ongoing threat to human and environmental health. So how is it mined? Um, now that we know how breccia pipes are formed, but how do miners get the uranium out of the ground? So there are several different forms of uranium mining depending on the type of deposit. Uh, one method is called open pit mining, and that's where the rock is basically dug out of open pits. And then there is in situ recovery or ISR, where oxygenated chemical solutions are pumped into groundwater to dissolve uranium in porous rock. And then the liquid containing uranium is pumped back up to the surface and it's processed to recover the uranium. And this is the most common form of uranium extraction in the US, but it isn't what's used in our region. Here, the method is underground mining. And in this case, once the ore body has been identified, a mine shaft is sunk into the ground in the vicinity of the ore, which you can also see in this graphic. Um, and then they make horizontal cuts that drive into the deposit itself. And to extract the ore, they'll often blast it and just transport the debris to the surface of the mine. And then once it's extracted, the uranium has to be trucked across native lands to the White Mesa Mill near Blanding, Utah, which Talia is gonna speak on later. And the photo in the photo to the right shows Canyon Mine, which is situated less than 10 miles from the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And Amber's about to talk about this, but I did just want to give you an example of uh, what a uranium mine in, in this region looks like. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Amber to discuss the impacts of uranium mining on the environment and human health. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Um, so, I mean, the reason we're all here today is because uranium mining and milling has already left a toxic and radioactive legacy, especially in the Southwest and especially in and near Indigenous communities. 
On the Navajo Nation alone, more than 500 abandoned uranium mines still exist today from the government driven uranium boom of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. These abandoned mines continually expose indigenous communities to uranium contaminated dust and drinking water. And in addition to the challenge and exorbitant costs of seeing these mines finally cleaned up is the challenge of ensuring that any cleanup efforts fully address the problem and don't just result in profit for a private company without fully taking care of the contamination that's impacting Navajo people and communities across the plateau. And um, the other challenge is making sure that these efforts do so in a just manner that doesn't simply transfer impacts from one indigenous community to the next. Recent epidemiological studies on the Navajo Nation have underscored not just the need for this cleanup, but the inherent long-term risks of uranium mining. Those studies have found that today, decades after mining companies left, elevated levels of uranium are found in the dust inside of people's homes and in the bodies of community members, even newborn children. Because of these impacts, the Navajo Nation banned uranium mining, milling, and transport back on their lands back in 2005. But unfortunately, because there are state highways that run through the Navajo Nation, uranium mining companies continue to believe that they're able to drive haul trucks through Navajo lands as long as they use those roads. And I want to be clear that the Hopi Nation has also experienced its own negative impacts from uranium mining. So I just want to point out that this map that I'm showing here is, is created by the US Environmental Protection Agency and it's focused on Navajo lands. But if we were showing uranium, uranium impacts beyond that, um, that you would see red dots uh, across the landscape uh, that's, that's shown on this map and beyond. The toxic legacy of uranium mining and the potential for further development is also seen on lands immediately to the north and south of the Grand Canyon. This map displays not just some of the past and existing uranium mines in the region, which are depicted by the radioactive symbols across the map. Um, and I'll talk about some of those in a moment, but also this map shows the level of interest in further exploitation of this region. Each orange dot that you see on this map, and there are over 8,000 of them, represent a mining claim that has once been staked prior to the temporary mining ban, which was established in 2012. Um, we'll get into that a little bit in a bit, but um, today this temporary ban is still in place, though its future is uncertain. So, um, but as long as this ban remains and you, it's depicted by the, the dark black uh, boundary lines here, as long as this, this ban remains in place, these, no new claims, no more orange dots can be um, established. And as long as a mining company or if a mining company doesn't manage to um, maintain each of these claims, then they will go away. Uh, and actually today there are less than 800 mining claims remaining within the withdrawal area. So it's just really important that we keep this temporary ban or this ban at all in place. So we've talked already about the inherent risks of uranium mining, or Megan did, and basically that uranium is pretty stable where mother nature deposited it in the earth's crust. But once we dig it up and expose it to oxygen, expose it to water, wind, and other elements, we open a Pandora's box where for as long as that uranium is radioactive, which is in the billions of years, the least radioactive isotope of uranium has a half-life of four and a half billion years, we humans have to manage it and keep it out of the human environment, out of the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the food we eat. So this already steep risk of uranium mining is further com compounded in the Grand Canyon region, and that's because of hydrogeology, the directions of groundwater flow and the speed with which groundwater travels underground. In the region around the Grand Canyon, the hydrogeology is very, very complex and it's very variable from one place to the next. Really, the only thing that's the same about the region is the fact that the layers of rock beneath the surface through which groundwater flows from the surface through the ground into groundwater aquifers and eventually out into the Grand Canyon via seeps and springs is highly fractured. So it's very difficult to determine based solely on the type of rock that makes up each layer whether or not water will travel through it. Um, faults and fractures can mean that an otherwise impermeable layer of rock um, can have basically a highway through it to get to other layers below it. Um, so we don't know how far groundwater travels um, from what point to what point and how long it will take. Sometimes groundwater can take a matter of hours or days 
to get from point A to point B. And in other cases, it can take decades or even hundreds or thousands of years to travel that distance. And hydrologists have described groundwater flow in the region as something more akin to a series of pipes designed by Dr. Seuss, where water from one location can travel in several different directions at once and at varying speeds as well. So what this comes down to is that there's no way at this point in time and maybe ever to ensure that a uranium mine will not contaminate groundwater or for that matter, drain groundwater that feeds critical seeps and springs inside the Grand Canyon itself. So the photos you see above are Thunder River on the left and Havasu Creek on the right. Both are purely groundwater fed. Um, Thunder River, if you've never hiked down to it, it's, you can hike down to it from the North Rim, is an oasis in an otherwise barren and very hot landscape. It flows straight out of a cliffside from a very important water source called the Redwall Moab Aquifer. It's sometimes called the R Aquifer or the RM Aquifer for short. And Havasu Creek is on the opposite side of the canyon, but it also flows from the R Aquifer at Blue Spring. Um, Havasu Creek is the sole source of water for the Havasupai tribe, whose village is in a remote side canyon of the Grand Canyon. And we'll have a guest on here from, from the Havasupai tribe in the weeks to come. Um, but this water is not only important as a water source, but the name Havasupai, Havasubaja means people of the blue green water. So mines beyond the rim and sometimes on the rim of the Grand Canyon endanger these critical water resources. Past mines have had problems too. And because these mines have no obligation for comprehensive monitoring and, um, and not necessarily, and they don't necessarily have a comprehensive cleanup plan that we would determine that we would decide or we would um, determine as being as being adequate, we can't even be sure that they haven't caused groundwater contamination. So some examples of known problems at various sites. Um, the first one is Orphan Mine, which isn't pictured here, but that mine sat right on the South Rim inside what is now Grand Canyon National Park, about a mile from the South Rim Village. That mine operated until about 1970 when the company shut it down and walked away. And that site is now today an ongoing federal cleanup site. It's cost $15 million and counting of taxpayer dollars for cleanup. And because of the mine, the National Park now warns hikers not to drink from Horn Creek, which flows in the drainage below the mine because of the high levels of uranium in that creek. Another example is Kanab North. It's on the upper, in the upper left photo here. That mine sat idle on the North Rim for decades. And during that time, radioactive dust from ore piles on the site blew beyond the mine's boundaries and contaminated land um, surrounding the mine site. And then Pine Nut Mine on the upper right here is also on the North Rim. It similarly sat idle for decades. And in 2009, when the company came back to reopen it, they discovered that what they thought, they, they thought that they had properly capped the mine shaft, um, but instead they discovered that over 3 million gallons of water had unexpectedly found its way into the mine shaft and had become heavily contaminated um, with uranium and other toxins. And in the lower photo here, again, is Canyon Mine, which Megan mentioned. It's the only mine that is currently allowed by the federal government to operate despite the temporary mining ban that I mentioned. And as Megan said, it's less than 10 miles from the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And despite the company's assumptions that it wouldn't encounter water in its mine shaft, which we know introduces a significant risk to the environmental safety of the operation, since 2016, that mine and that mine shaft has taken on over 30 million gallons of previously clean groundwater. And once inside the mine, the water becomes contaminated with elevated levels of uranium and arsenic that must be managed to ensure it doesn't travel into groundwater aquifers. One of the biggest concerns with Canyon Mine is that evidence suggests that because of that hydrogeology we talked about, the highly fractured nature of the, the rock beneath the mine, that any contamination from Canyon Mine could find its way into the R aquifer, which based on the mine's location, um, contamination could directly impact Havasu Creek and the Havasu by tribe. And this graphic is just to give you a visual of the flooding that we're talking about. Um, they started digging the mine shaft in the late 80s when the mine was first permitted. And then it sat on standby with a 50 foot deep mine shaft for many years. And they picked it back up again in 2013 to continue digging. Um, it's now 1470 feet deep. 
And in 2016, they reached a depth where they pierced this shallow aquifer and began taking on water inside the mine shaft. And you can see that every year since then, the volume of water flowing into that mine shaft has only increased. We don't know yet how much water is flowed in in 2020. We'll know those figures sometime in January of 2021. But so far, it doesn't look like that problem is getting less. It, it seems to be getting worse every year. And the, the contamination that's, um, the contaminate, contaminant levels in this flood water um, are incredibly high. The, the levels of arsenic have been as high as 29 times the EPA drinking water standard, and the levels of uranium have been as high as four times the drinking water standard. And so this is definitely water that we don't want migrating into drinking water sources. And I have a, a short illustrating illustrated video that I want to show you to explain a little bit more about Canyon Mine. So just bear with me while I get this situated. Let's talk about the Grand Canyon, one of the natural wonders of the world, the ancestral home of Native American tribes, carved over millions of years by the lifeblood of the Southwest, the Colorado River. Except for the river, life around the Grand Canyon is very, very dry. The seeps and springs in the Grand Canyon watershed are what make life possible for the animals and people who live there. The Havasupai have lived deep inside the Grand Canyon for millennia amidst stunning blue-green waterfalls fed by springs that flow from water deep underground. But all of this is threatened by uranium mining. The Canyon Mine is located less than 10 miles from the Grand Canyon and sits atop the Havasupai's water source. It threatens to continue a toxic legacy that haunts the Grand Canyon today. At the Canyon Mine, the mining company hit water which started filling up the mine shaft. And that water, contaminated with uranium, has to go somewhere. In 2013, the uranium mine pumped out less than 700,000 gallons of groundwater. Six years later, they pumped over 10 million gallons, exceeding the capacity of the mine's containment pond. At one point, the mine even sprayed contaminated water into the national forest and illegally trucked it out of state. If that contaminated water percolates down, no one knows where it will end up. The seeps and springs and waterfalls around the Grand Canyon are all connected, but scientists haven't mapped exactly how and where. So at any point, that uranium water could end up contaminating the Havasupai's water and the Grand Canyon itself. We are playing Russian roulette with radioactive water and the uranium industry once even more. There are more than 800 active mining claims in the area today, and the mining industry is pushing to lift a temporary ban on new mining claims. Uranium companies even want your taxpayer dollars to keep them in business. This is why the Intertribal Council of Arizona, which represents 21 Native American communities, tribes, and nations, is calling for a permanent ban on new uranium claims around the Grand Canyon. In 2019, Democrats and Republicans in the House of Representatives passed a bill to permanently protect the Grand Canyon watershed, but it has yet to reach the president's desk. It's time for Congress to act because there is too much at risk and the Grand Canyon is no place for uranium mining. All right, let me resize things here. I wish this was a little smoother. Okay. So before I wrap up my section of this presentation, I just want to share what we and our partners are doing to address the Grand Canyon related uranium threats. The Navajo Nation cleanup issue is a critical one and we are ready to help if and as our help is useful for the Navajo Nation, but the majority of our time right at this very moment is focused on working alongside a long list of tribal nations and communities as well as other organizations to protect the Grand Canyon lands and waters. The first thing we're doing is seeking to make that temporary mining ban permanent, like you saw in the video, um, which can only be done through an act of Congress. In 2019, the Grand Canyon Centennial Protection Act, which would again make that temporary mining ban permanent, 
made its way through the US House of Representatives and was introduced in the Senate, but that's where it stalled in 2020. So we're working with our tribal partners and members of surrounding communities to lobby Congress to get this done. Um, if we don't have a signed bill by the end of this year, which is possible, we, we do have a chance through a bill called the National Defense Authorization Act, which the, the permanent mining ban is now attached to as an amendment. Um, it's passed the House. The Senate version does not include that. So it's up to a conference committee to, to decide whether or not that bill will remain um, attached to this larger must pass bill. Um, if that doesn't happen, we're gonna work toward a strategy for the next Congress in 2021. And secondly, um, we're working with partners to ensure that Canyon Mine isn't allowed to worsen its impact. We're doing this right now through a careful advocacy um, campaign with the state and federal regulators and the most pressing objective at the moment is influencing the review of the mine's upcoming aquifer protection permit, which is supposed to protect groundwater. So we wanna make sure that, that that happens. And with that, I will pass it off to Talia to take us to the finish line. Talia. Thank you, Amber. And thank you, Megan, for your presentations. Uh, yeah, this, this issue of uranium, um, it's very close to home for me, um, me being Diné and growing up on the res. I was, I grew up in Tonalia, Arizona, which is about 27 miles east of Tuba City. And every day I passed a uh, Italian's pile, the Tuba City disposal site, um, which is also called Rare Metals. And there used to be a trailer park community located right next to this tailings pile. And when I was a kid, there it was just open. There was no fence. There was no sign. It wasn't capped. And, you know, I had friends that lived in that community. And once it was capped, where they basically put a bunch of dirt on top, those kids would go up this tailings pile because it looked fun. It looked like a big sand dune. And they would play on it and they would roll down. And, you know, when it would rain, water would gather at the bottom and they would play in the water. And, um, it wasn't until several years later that those folks in that little community were asked to relocate because people were getting sick, people were dying. And, um, and by then it was too late. You know, people again were, were already um, getting sick with various cancers and various diseases. And so um, I then moved to New Mexico, Church Rock, New Mexico, which I later found out is the home of the largest radioactive spill in US history, which occurred in 1979. Um, it happened on July 16th at 5.30 AM in the community of Church Rock and over 94 million gallons of radioactive sludge was released um, through a breach dam. And it went through the arroyos down the Rio Perco past the Arizona, New Mexico state line all the way to the little Colorado River so every community between Church Rock and the Little Colorado has been impacted on some level. And um, we are still pleading for health studies, water studies, soil studies, air studies. Uh, we have not had any um, resources that have been pouring in. Um, mind you, this, this incident happened three months after the Three Mile Island incident in Pennsylvania. And those communities had a ton of resources and uh, national media coverage pouring in and supporting them. However, when we talk about the church rock spill, uh, very few people know about it. And, you know, and, and let's be real, it's because it happened on, on native land, on, on the res, you know? So a lot of that was swept under the rug. Um, to this day, we're still dealing with new proposed uranium mines. For instance, the Roca Honda mine on the base of Mount Taylor, which is a sacred mountain, not only to Navajo, but to several other tribes, both in New Mexico and in Arizona. And so uh, we never gave consent for the mining companies to come in, for the US government to come in and exploit our homelands. You know, these are all complements of the Cold War, the Manhattan Project. And um, yeah, and so we're still living with that waste today. And across the United States, tribal lands are unduly impacted by uranium mining, uranium processing, weapons testing, and the storage of radioactive waste. Most US uh, uranium ore is mined in the Western United States. There are 15,000 abandoned uranium mine locations in 14 Western states. 75% of those are on federal and tribal lands. 
and there are 4,225 defense-related uranium mines with approximately 11% on tribal lands. Again, indigenous communities are often on the front lines of defending our territories, our sacred landscapes, our resources, and our rights from extractive projects and corporate and outside interests. And we continue to deal with governmental entities like the Bureau of Indian Affairs who manages energy development on 55 million surface acres held in trust or restricted status for tribes and their members. And they are notorious for having issues with oversight and um, infrastructure, uh, collecting data, equipment, workforce planning, but also collaborating with stakeholders. And oftentimes uh, tribes are lumped into that stakeholder category and we have to recognize that we are not mere stakeholders, we are sovereign nations. And so I wanna go ahead and switch gears to the White Mesa Mill. Uh, what is the White Mesa Mill and what happens there? Well, the White Mesa Mill is the last operating conventional uranium mill in the country. It was built in 1979 to process uranium ore from the surrounding region. And about a decade later, the mill's operator started running alternate feed through the mill and discarding the resulting waste on site. Alternate feed is uranium bearing material from rare metals mining, uranium conversion plants, contaminated defense facilities, and other radioactive and contaminated cleanup sites from across the country. Energy Fuels disposes of the mill's radioactive and toxic waste, often called tailings, and what they call impoundments, large waste pits that take up to 275 acres next to the mill. They, there are currently five uh, tailings impoundments, and they are called cells 1, 2, 3, 4A, and 4B, um, and this is a part of the mill tailings management system. So there are some, uh, some very grave health and environmental hazards and concerns um, around this mill. So cells one, two, and three at the White Mesa Mill were constructed with a single thin layer of plastic liner between a layer of soil and a layer of crushed rock. Today, these cells would be built with two liners and a system meant to detect and collect anything leaking through the first liner before it escapes the environment. The mill also emits radioactive and toxic air pollutants that can travel off-site, including radon, sulfur dioxide, and nitrogen oxide. Stockpiled ore and alternate feeds um, are, may not be adequately covered and may also blow off-site. So White Mesa residents have often reported smelling pollutants from the mill. There are also truckloads of um, truckloads that come in at night uh, to, with ore and hazardous materials and they travel on the Arizona and Utah highways and they're allowed to do that because um, they're also state highways. Um, and again, that's so that they can get this ore to the mill. Um, <clears throat> there are increased levels of contaminants such as nitrate, nitrite and chloroform um, that are perched in the aquifer beneath the mill site. So there are, of course, um, very um, important community, com community concerns that come out of this. Um, the mill was built right on top of some ancestral lands for the Ute Mountain Ute tribe. It disturbs uh, burial sites and other cultural sites. Many residents in the community of White Mesa and Bluff fear that the Navajo sandstone aquifer, which provides drinking water to the area, will be contaminated. This primary uh, drinking water uh, aquifer lies beneath, again, the mill site. Um, the state of Utah regulators uh, may not be requiring energy fuels to guarantee enough money uh, that will be available for cleanup. So there usually there's a, uh, a current guarantee called a surety bond. Um, it's for about 20 million, but other uranium mills in the Colorado Plateau have cost up to more than a hundred million in cleanup. So that's definitely not enough for any kind of cleanup if, if the mill should uh, need it. So what is the state of Utah proposing to do? Well, the mill has been operating with the state's blessing since 2007 under an expired radioactive materials license, which is the main operating permit for the mill. The license was renewed in 2018, giving energy fuels a green light to run the mill for another decade. 
Energy Fields also has a groundwater discharge permit that is meant to prevent groundwater contamination. That permit expired in 2010 and the state renewed it in 2018. Also in 2018, the state gave Energy Fields permission to process a radioactive sludge left over from enriching uranium at a plant near the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma run by a company called Sequoia Fuels. So I wanna talk a little bit about Sequoia Fuels um, for a moment and uh, just share what happened there. On January 4th, 1986, just four months before the Chernobyl release, Sequoia Fuels Corporation experienced a rupture of an overfilled cylinder um, containing ur uranium fluoride um, with an estimated amount of 29,500 pounds of this gaseous content. Um, and that, and it released a plume. The plume left the plant and traveled 29 kilometers and over several sparsely populated areas. Um, this incident led to the death of a 26 year old worker named James Harrison, who was of African and Cherokee uh, heritage. And it also, um, had the hospitalization of 37 out of 42 on-site workers. The facility's ventilation system carried the deadly plume 15 miles away where Harrison inhaled the, the hydrofluoric acid, which then led to his death. <clears throat> and then in January 1990, there was a spill that dumped 20,000 pounds of uranium tetrafluoride powder which was cleaned up, but groundwater tests exposed contamination of up to 35,000 times the amount of uranium allowed by the federal government. Meanwhile, the state of Utah applied and gained authority to take over regulating uranium byproduct material through the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Agreement Statement Program, where states can sign formal agreements with the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and assume regulatory responsibility over certain byproduct and source material, as well as um, small quantities of special nuclear material. There was also a policy statement included admitting that for the White Mesa mill to be viable economically, the owner of energy fields would need to be able to expand its business to include processing alternate feed materials. The state of Utah has the authority to re-examine the conditions on which alternate feeds uh, may be processed. However, they do not do so. Energy Fuels was essentially paid to process uh, Sequoia Fuels sludge. Which brings us back to the White Mesa Mill. And I really wanna highlight a very important point here of how this waste is being taken from tribal communities, from one tribal community to another. So this waste is being transported, for instance, from the Cherokee Nation to the Ute Mountain Ute Nation. Um, and then also, uh, I wanna dive in here. So uh, while the Cherokee Nation was celebrating this long and hard fight to remove the Sequoia Fields waste from their tribal lands, this sludge again was being shipped to the Ute Mountain Ute tribal lands. Um, and that community of Ute Mountain Ute is only four miles from this mill. So it's very, very close. On top of that, we also have the Navajo Nation. Um, Navajo Nation, uh, has uh, close to 30 million tons of uranium uh, ore that was mined from 1944 to 1986. And the agency says that there are more, uh, more than 500 abandoned uranium mines. But I also want to highlight that these are clusters of mines. They're not individual mines. So we have something like more over like a thousand abandoned uranium mines on Navajo. Um, that have not been cleaned up and are still posing a threat to people living near, nearby and also to our local water supplies. Um, this ore was used by the federal government to build atomic weapons. And in 2007, multiple federal agencies created a five-year plan to address uranium pollution on the Navajo Nation. A second five-year plan was created in 2014 but much of the mace, uh, waste remains on the sites. Um, and it, again, it may be taken to the White Mesa Mill. The nuclear fuel cycle exploits communities that are already inundated by extractive industries and economies. And for tribal communities, we do not have enough resources to inform, educate, and advocate for baselines that demand transparency and to hold those accountable um, it really takes people power. And so it really um, 
takes building that community capacity as well. Which brings me to our current uh, state of affairs and the work that we're doing around the White Mesa Mill. Um, currently, the mill is seeking to import alternate feed uh, for a fee to generate revenue due to the low cost of uranium. Energy Fuels disclosed recently on an investor call that the alternate feed business nets them anywhere from five to 15 million per year. Essentially, they're getting paid to take in the waste. White Mesa Mill is not a waste facility. And energy resource, um, energy fuels would be bankrupt without all these federal loopholes that they've identified. Earlier this year, energy fuels requested to import 2000 drums of radioactive material from, from the uh, Baltic nation of Estonia, which contains less than 1%. It's 0.23% uranium mixed in with other continents and radioactive minerals. There are no facilities in Estonia that are licensed to, to, to receive this material, which is why they want to send it here. The powder is classified as alternate feed, which unlike natural uranium bearing ores requires additional state approval before it can be imported from overseas. Energy fuels basically would run this uh, through the mill, run this waste through the mill, extract what little uranium it contains, which is again, less than 1%, and dump the remaining waste into the pits where they will stay. <clears throat> there was also a separate proposal to ship 136 tons of radioactive material from two atomic research sites in Japan to the White Mesa Mill. The proposal was approved in July without any public comment. The material from Japan is a mix of natural bearing uranium ores and materials left over from testing by the atomic the Japan Atomic Energy Agency, and it includes uranium loaded sands, resins, and carbons. Energy Fuels says it will recycle both the Japanese and Estonian material into yellow cake uranium that can be used in nuclear reactors. In both cases, once the uranium is extracted, over 99.7% of the material will be disposed um, on, the mills, um, on the mills site. Um, and this is allowed under the mill's operating permits. The White Mesa mill already stockpiles ore and low level waste. Again, some of that may not be adequately covered and has the um, potential of going um, off, off of this offsite and traveling with the wind. There are serious concerns and anxieties, again, around water contamination and of course the many transportation routes where you, that you see there with the map. There we go. <laughs> um, so, yes, there's there, most of these uh, transportation routes go through rural communities that are absolutely not prepared to handle any kind of radioactive catastrophe if it should happen. Um, and there have been radioactive spills from the trucks in the past that, are, that have been going to the mill. Um, so the department hopes that they'll have a decision on whether to grant energy fuels a permit to request for their permit request before the end of the year, but there's no firm deadline. So, so what we're doing, we keep, we keep working, we keep organizing. I call this life work because uranium again has a half-life of 4.5 billion years, which means our children will be facing the consequences just like we are and, and probably much worse. We have to stand together and we have to fight together because nuclear issues impact all of us one way or another. And when we talk about uranium, it's important that we talk about the whole nuclear fuel chain and not just one part of it. Nuclear is not green and it is not clean. It is very carbon intensive, everything from the mining, the milling, the hauling, energy, weapons and waste. So, I would like to invite you all again to join me next Thursday at the same time to welcome our first panel of native experts who will share their vast knowledge and wisdom on the environmental impacts of uranium and nuclear. And for, and for us native peoples, again, these are very um, complicated um, issues um, for us to even speak on. They're emotional issues and um, and so it takes, it takes a lot for folks to, to come up and, and share a lot of this information. It's very technical. There's a lot of technical jargon. So we will do our best to unpack it and translate it in the, in, in the 
best way we can. So I really want to express um, my deep appreciation to my colleagues for joining me this evening and sharing their knowledge and wisdom. Uh, the energy program, Amber Raimondo is our energy director. Megan Kelly is our energy program associate. And so thank you, ladies. I know we have a couple of questions and we have a few more minutes. So um, maybe we can go ahead and try to answer a couple. And um, I'll go ahead and read off the first one. This one is for Amber. It says, what's the process through which a pre-2012 mining claim can expire or fall away? Good question. Um, so basically, when a mining company files a claim, there is a very minimal amount of work that they have to do every year to be able to keep that mining claim alive. Um, and I think it slightly depends on how much of a, a maintenance fee they have to pay, but it's, it's minimal as far as um, what a corporation should be expected to pay to be able to sit on public lands um, and, and be able to eventually profit off of it. So it's in the matter of hundreds of dollars that they have to pay every year. So if they quit paying that fee and they quit doing the maintenance on site, which can basically amount to just moving dirt around, um, then it will expire. So since the 2012 mining ban was put in place, there were over 8,000 mining claims in that map. It climbed up to over 10,000 before the, the mining ban was put in place. And then since then, those mining claims have dwindled to around 800 mining claims that, are, that remain. Those are the ones that mining companies have been um, supposedly keeping their, their upkeep on. So that's a simple explanation, I suppose. Oops, sorry, I'm getting lost in the Q&A and the chat. So there's a couple in the, in the chat as well. Um, let me go ahead and read one from the chat. It says, what did the Cherokee Nation do in response to the accident? Um, yeah, so uh, they, uh, they worked with the state of Oklahoma to um, make sure that Sequoia Fields Corporation cleaned up their mess. Um, they actually put in, um, they both pitched in for cleanup, both Cherokee Nation and the state of Oklahoma um, to help, uh, again, cover the cost of the cleanup. They did even take it to court. They, because the company Energy Fuel, or no, I'm sorry, Sequoia, Fuel, Sequoia Fuels Corporation, um, they were having a heck of a time identifying a facility that would take in this waste because it had high concentrations of um, thorium and uranium 238, I believe. And um, so nobody would take it and they had a, a really hard time identifying any kind of facility. It took, uh, it took many years. And that's when the state of Utah stepped in. Again, the state of Utah has an agreement with the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, to be an agreement state. And that really gives them the authority to regulate any kind of radioactive material going to the mill. And so um, because of that, uh, because they were allowed to become an agreement state, the state of Utah, um, they were then, um, Sequoia Fuels then decided to uh, have that waste shipped to uh, the White Mesa community. However, they, the Cherokee Nation, I'm sure wasn't aware that, you know, it was going to be going to the Ute Mountain Ute community or, or near it. Um, and again, this is where a lot of the conversations need to happen, um, especially within tribal communities and between tribal communities where we're sharing this information um, and we're standing in solidarity against nuclear colonialism, you know, because it really is uh, all, in, indigenous communities are inundated with uranium mining. Um, almost all uranium mining around the world is on or near indigenous communities. So for those real, for those reasons, it's really important for native peoples, indigenous peoples to learn about our different histories when it comes to being impacted by uranium or nuclear and, and really understanding how um, this waste is being transported between our communities and how we're not um, talking about it and how we're, you know, we're, we're not having these conversations amongst ourselves. And so um, the Cherokee Nation, 
you know, they were, they were happy to get rid of this. It, it took them a very, very long time for them to um, work with the state and work with federal entities to get this waste out of there. Um, again, this is, this is, these are um, such sentiments that a lot of Native peoples feel, you know, and for Navajo, we definitely feel that too. You know, where, where is the waste going to go from our tribal communities? Is it going to, we don't want, you know, we don't definitely don't want any other communities to be impacted because we know of the adverse impacts. We know what it does. You know, we, we know that it kills people. And so, you know, to, to knowingly, um, have this waste being transported between our communities is absolutely heartbreaking and 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 you know appalling. This is this is why we need to have these conversations. This is why you know um, we need to continue to work with tribal communities um, and really start sharing resources and information across the board. So um, I hope that answers that question. And let me see. I want to go ahead and switch back to the chat. Okay, let's see. We got one more question. It says, why was there a public comment period for the proposed shipment of radioactive waste from Estonia, but not from Japan? Great question. Yeah, well, you know, the industry is really tricky and um, I honestly don't have a great answer here, but I will I will push this into our parking lot and I will um, meet with some of our other folks who have been working on this issue very closely and we will follow up with that information. But this is still an ongoing thing. Again, there's no firm deadline on when this um, on when the department would make a, a decision about it. And so, um, yes, I apologize. We don't I don't have a, an answer for you on that, but. Uh, I will follow up with with folks on any other questions. And it looks like we don't have any other questions here. Um, and again, I just want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. And I do want to drop a few names of some of our upcoming panelists who will be joining us um, just to, you know, give a sneak peek. We will have uh, Dr. Tommy Rock joining us on one of our panels. And we also have Dr. Len Nessifer from uh, Native Outdoors who will be joining us as well. We um, will also have uh, Leona Morgan joining us and um, Ian Zabarte from Western Shoshone. We also have uh, a Marshallese uh, speaker who will be joining us and highlighting the, the histories and the impacts that have happened in the Marshall Islands. Um, Again, a lot of people don't know what happened in the Marshall Islands, very similar to what happened in Church Rock, right? Uh, a lot of weapons testing, uh, their homelands have been absolutely desecrated. Their peoples have been um, displaced and it's, it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking. But I wanna, again, build these, um, these conversations and I wanna connect our communities because it's absolutely important. And I believe our Marshallese relatives um, need, also need um, need space to to share to share their stories as well. So I'm really excited to have a lot of really great speakers joining us in these upcoming panels. Very excited um, for everybody joining us here tonight. Please feel free to um, share the flyer. We will be posting that on our Facebook uh, page here soon. And then also, again, if you registered for this session, then you are automatically registered for all the following sessions. Uh, feel free to share with your friends and family and network. Uh, we really hope to expand this conversation to beyond the plateau because again, we know that uranium um, is a very large issue. It's a heavy issue. And um, we appreciate everybody taking time to to learn more about it. it it's, not, it's not for the lighthearted. Uh, and I appreciate everybody having the courage to even um, learn about it and, and, and talk about it. So thank you so much. Everybody have a great evening. And I look forward to you all coming back next Thursday and joining us. Take care. Thanks, Talia. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I've ended the live Facebook stream. <laughs> OK. Yay.
Good job, guys. Good job, team. Excellent, excellent. All right. Well, 